it's a, uh, let's see, today is June 14th, 2016, and this is Larry Morrissey, and I'm at Wells Church, and I'm here to talk with Greg Campbell. Uh, he's a longtime member of the church, and uh, to hear his story about being at Wells, and this is for the Wells Oral History Project. That's fine. Maneuver it around a little bit. Um, yeah, so why don't we start off, if you could just kind of tell me, um, like I was saying before the tape got on, nobody, no, very few people were born into Wells Church, so how did you, well, maybe, uh, let's step that back one bit. Talk about your, um, if you were raised religious and if that, and kind of your background as a, as a child, where you were born, where you grew up, a little bit about your religious upbringing as a child, a young adult, and then kind of lead into religion. I got gotcha. you. Um, I was raised and um, born in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, my birth date is um, February the 17th, um, 1959. Grew up overlooking the mighty Mississippi. Um, stayed there until I went to junior college, Nance Community College at the time, Hines Community College. Um, left there and um, started my career in photography. I actually started my um, career before then, but I was, let me back up, I was um, raised in the Church of Christ by very, you know, my dad was a deacon. We went to the church every time the doors were open. Um, you know, a Christian home. And... Um, you know, I really appreciate my parents for doing that for me. Um, as I said, I grew up there, left, went to school, um, started. I was in the, grew up, was in Boy Scouts, became an Eagle Scout. That was a large part of my youth. Um, was in the band in junior high and high school. Quit the band my senior year of high school and traded it in for a camera. And I say the rest is history. Um, ever since then, I've basically been a professional photographer. I got six months after I got my first camera with my first income tax refund, I got a um, request to be a photographer for the newspaper, shoot football games on Friday night for them. So I did that, and then in the summers did soccer tournaments, tennis matches, swim meets, you name it. And then went to Heinz and did the same thing and decided that school wasn't for me, so I started at the Claire and Ledger in January of 80, and um, as a lab technician for the focus sections, which was the neighborhood sections at the time. And when Gannett bought the paper, you didn't have to have a degree. Since I didn't have a degree, they, um, the Hattermans, when they owned it, you had to have a degree. And the Gannett, you didn't have that. So I was ready to either go back to school, um, get a job, do something. And luckily they hired me as a staff photographer. And I did that for like three, three and a half more years. And got burned out as typical in that business. And had been married a year and decided just to to leave, to jump ship and a month and just go out on my own, go to the freelance world. And a month after doing that, I told my late wife, who grew up United Methodist, her brother-in-law was the longtime United Methodist minister, and her daughter, her sister later became a United Methodist minister in life, that I wanted to join a church. I was ready to to. I guess changed that part of my life. Um, when we were at the newspaper, it was in the early 80s, and we, you know, partied a lot and lived a, you know, life of singles. And so I was ready to, to join a church. And I tell people this all the time. I appreciate my parents growing me up in a religious, in a Christian home. But I just felt like the church you know that they grew me up in was not where I needed to go and I had some being a very fundamental church as the church of Christ is 
I had some reservations about, you know, something that was more rituals and everything. But, um, you know, I knew that, you know, give it a try. So we tried one other church that was near where we lived at the time, and it just didn't seem a good fit. Um, at the time, there were too many older, elderly people in membership there. Um, so I just didn't feel connected. And I said, what about Wells? And Virginia is my late wife's name. She, of course, grew up Methodist, and she knew Keith. And I knew some people that went here from the newspaper days. And so she said, sure, let's go try it out. So I don't know the exact date, but it was August of 1986, 30 years ago this coming August. So tell me, what did you know about, like, what was the, the rep, or what, what did you know about Wells before you came over here? Not a lot other than, like I said, some people at the Clarence Ledger went here and um, I was, that's a good question because obviously I knew something the fact that I were, said let's go there. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. I just I knew some people, um, you know, um, that, um, well, David Hampton is one of them that still, you know, attends here. He was working you know, at the paper then still. And, um, and of course, she knew Keith, and she knew, and she said, let's do it. And um, that Sunday in August of 1986 was the first Sunday back into the sanctuary after they took on a renovation project. And I immediately, you know, felt at home. I don't remember. I told Keith last Sunday when we celebrated our 90th, I don't remember what he preached on, but I, the choir sang them dry bones. And I do remember that. And um, it wasn't, like I said, I was kind of scared about it being real ritual. It wasn't, you know, the choir didn't wear robes. Um, you know, it was just, it, it, I just felt welcome. And I walked out that Sunday and said, I think, you know, this is the place. And that was, you know, almost 30 years ago. Wow. It was that quick, just. But I, I would imagine, from what I know about Church of Christ, it's fairly, is that the one they don't use instruments? Correct. Okay. It's no instrument, no instruments, um, a cappella singing, very fundamental beliefs. Um, the main belief, one of them is, like I said, I appreciate my parents growing me up, is the fact that, you know, if you're not a member of that body of ch church, you know, you're not going to be saved. And that's their, you know, main belief. And um, I just, you know, my God is not that kind of God. Um, but like I said, I appreciate them, you know, growing me up in a Christian home. And I lived a life, sowed my oats, you know, and then decided, you know, I wanted to. It's, it's basically, it's maturity. And, you know, I was growing up and decided that I wanted to cultivate a different kind of friends, you know, to be a part of. Um, like I said, most of us at the newspaper at that time were young. It was in the early 80s. Um, most, you know, we were starting to get married, some of us. But, um, you know, I just, like I said, I just, when I, I, it wasn't, you know, let's try other churches out, you know, you it was like make a tour no no it was one church in wales and i'm still here almost 30 years later well tell me about that the first maybe year or two of being a member here kind of how you kind of acclimated did you jump in right away in terms of being involved or is it, was it gradual um i think i said earlier virginia my late wife and i were um had been married a little over a year when we came here and I think we joined pretty soon I can't remember I don't think it took us that long to to join she was a member at St. Luke's and that's where we got married and um she just transferred her membership I guess um we became pretty much almost immediately involved in um Bible study um we had um let me call it my brain home home Bible studies, I guess you'd call it. 
um, where we met in people's homes um, or other places outside the church. Um, I think we did it like once a week. And we became involved in that, and that really got us into the the network, I guess you could say, of the church, um, meeting people, getting more involved. Um, and at the time, well, actually, before we got married, we realized, you know, that we were, you know, going to get married in Ireland. We'd want to have a family. We both found out we had fertility problems. So, um, just basically to cut to the chase, if it wasn't for Wales Church and those prayer, those study groups, that's what they are, study groups, um, my daughter probably wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't be where I am in my life right now as far as, um, you know, the love of God and my path. Um, you know, they prayed my daughter into this world, and I truly believe that, and we just, you know, it it helped to become, you know, involved in those study groups because it was small groups of, you know, 10, 12 people or so getting together and studying the Word and fellowshipping and praying over each other's, you know, requests. And and we did that. Um, we became involved in Wells Fest because um, we joined in August and then Wells Fest was basically a month later. And um, we started going to that, and then I started, um, I think, pretty much the next year, started doing the publicity for it, since I'm a photographer and in that business. And also, pretty soon after we joined, when Keith found out I was a photographer, he wrote me into doing our church directory. And so I did that. That was about a year-long project of taking the photos, editing the photos, and even laying out, editing the whole directory. I did everything. And even put the, my, our home phone number as the church phone number. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whoops. Um, it looked familiar to me. It, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and then I don't know how long through the path we both came... Um, co-council on ministry um, chair persons council on ministries we were both co-chairs um, I later took on the responsibility of um, doing our newsletter Wellspring I edited it I don't know how long in the pro you know how long I'd been here before I started doing that it wouldn't too long. Um, I did that for I don't know how many years, maybe 10, a good number. And um, luckily, Jim Young came on board about that time and took it over. Um, I was, it got to where um, my business was growing. I really didn't have time to do it, and I was having to take Sunday school time to do it. And you know, just decided it was time to to give it up. Um, but um, I've been a um, I'm still am on the um, the um, I've been a trustee. I'm still am on the administrative board. Um, Let's talk about Wells Fest for a little bit since it was something that happened. So, you know, it's, I would assume, kind of the most visible thing, kind of community wide, that the church does. <coughs> tell about your kind of experience. First, just tell me about your experience of working with it and maybe some memorable yeah. memories of, of being involved. Well, like I said earlier, we um, joined in August of 86, and basically a month later was Wells Fest. And it was at, um, it was still when they were having it at, at um, the old Riverside Park. And um, we went and enjoyed it and um, got to know more Wells people, you know, by going and stuff. And then I think it was the next year they moved it to Lakeland Park, which is now Jimmy um, 
Jamie Bell, Fowler Park, because they were renovating this when they closed Riverside Park and was building the um, Museum of Natural Science and renovating it and doing all that, I think, is when they did that. And I, like I said, I became the um, director of public relations or public relations chairperson for Wells Fest. And I, um, you know, started doing all the publicity. And Wells Fest was, what, we just celebrated our, what, 33rd or something? It was, you know, just beginning. So it was um, kind of hard in a way to do the publicity because um, everybody said, oh, you're just another church festival. And, um, you know, we would gradually get publicity and we became a reputation as, because we were one of the first family-friendly festivals in Jackson, if not the first. And so we started developing a reputation and, you know, and people knew it was the last Saturday in September. But we still needed publicity and stuff. Um, so I did that and enjoyed it and... Um, you know, like I said, it was sometimes like, you know, pulling teeth, trying to get somebody to give a sponsorship or get donations or something. Um, you know, now they're knocking the doors down trying to, you know, want our money that we raise because, you know, we raise an average of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 every year now. And was that something that started from the beginning or when did that Yes, start? the, well... The first Wells Fest, actually, the monies went to the building fund of the church. Malcolm White, did you not know the story? I know that story, yeah. Okay. He tells it. Yeah. <laughs> he told it what, a couple years ago when we won that the Arts Award. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the first year. But after that, it's gone to the community. It's, as we say, Wells Fest is Wells' gift to the community. And it truly is. Um, and that's your big news hook, really, in terms of getting you know, the... Yeah. Announcing who's going to be the recipient. Right. Kind of but like I said, early on when I was doing the PR, it was, you know, oh, you're just another church festival, you know. Um, why do you need all this advertising and, you know, stuff? Um, but as it grew and all, it's, you know, it's become a fixture. And, um, you know, like I said, people, charities are jumping at the bit to be selected as a beneficiary for it. Um, I think I did that job for about 10 years until I was out of town one Wells Fest for a family wedding. And um, I said, well, I've done it long enough. Let somebody else do it. So Peggy Hampton took it over. <laughs> and she's continued the torch. And luckily, as Wells Fest has grown, made her job a little easier, you know. Do you have any specific memories of, of actual festival days that were that stick out in your mind or people that were <coughs> performers or things that happened at it? Yeah, several. One um, is not too fun to remember, but a long time, still a member here, had an episode. We um, used to serve... Um, shish kebabs and um, she got choked on a shish kebab luckily there was doctor nearby and other medical personnel and you know we were able to they were able to take care of the situation and she's still living and member of this congregation today um, one of the performers that I remember that um, for a number of years Malcolm did all the Line, lining up all the music entertainment. I don't know how many, but a number of years. And then he decided to pass the reins over to Raphael Sims, who's done an excellent job. Um, but um, I think Malcolm was in charge the year, um, which was probably our biggest headliner up until that date, was Sam the Sham... Um, I forgot his last name. He was known as Sam the Sham. Oh, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's it. He performed. Oh, wow. I don't remember what year, but that was, like I said, up until then, that was our pretty big headliner. Um, and he performed, 
you know, by himself, and that was a big deal. Since then, you know, we've had Matt McAnally, you know, perform um, before, and that, um, you know, came at, you know, one of the chairpersons, you know, sits on tune and said, well, your people get in touch with my people, and it worked out. I mean, it was just, I guess you could say a God thing. Um, it's, um, through the years, it's grown, of course, in size and in being able to raise pretty, now, all the um, proceeds is pretty much, the festival cost is pretty much taken care of through sponsorship now. Um, so everything we raise is, you know, for the charity, for the beneficiary. Um, it, um, we've had some, you know, big competition through the years. We still managed, used to, for a number of years, I know at least a couple, Blue Claus and Blue Shield held their big kid zone event. Um, same day, same weekend at the old, where we used to be at Riverside Park, which is the floor's bluff part now, and we were across Lakeland Drive. But we played on that. We were free for the basic, you know, and they were charged, and we shared parking spaces. And, I mean, it worked out. Mm -hmm. And they later, you know, quit having it, and, of course, we continued on. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it's just, it's, and I continued to do photography of the event and, you know, enjoy it. And I'm also, I kind of, um, and one of the stage managers as well kind of enjoyed doing it, being backstage and making sure the music um, acts, you know, had plenty of water and food and stuff like that because they all perform free of charge. So the least we can do is, you know, give them a T-shirt and some water and a meal and, you know, try to see their to their needs. And I, I kind of do that and also, you know, take pictures as well. What are some other um, ministries or, or activities? Um, I know you, you mentioned your <coughs> council and some other. What are maybe some other ministries specifically that the church has that you either have an interest in or have been involved in? Well, one ministry that I got um, involved in through a um, dear friend, mentor of mine, um, was mission trip. He had gone to Tulumet, Mexico, and um, which was kind of, um, I don't know if weird's the right word. My late wife had wanted to go on that mission trip, and she had um, health issues, and I asked her to, you know, go get a physical before she obligated to go on the mission trip, to go in the mountains of Mexico, and and she did, and because of that physical and all, she found out that she wasn't in good health. She, I think that was that time she had found out she had had a heart attack. <laughs> and so it was like, okay, you're not going to Mexico. So my dear friend Keith Ferguson had been, and he said, you need to go. You need to go, Greg, and you need to, you know, take your camera and take pictures. And so... I prayed about it and decided, you know, this is something I want to do. Um, and, um, you know, go in, you know, memory of my late wife, go for me, you know. And so I went. And to make a long story short, I went for five years um, straight until even took my daughter for a couple of those years. Um, we had to quit going because of safety reasons. But what I did on those trips, it was um, the mission itself was part construction, a little construction. When I started going, the, the church and some other churches built a medical clinic there in Tulumet, Mexico. And by the time I started going, the medical clinic was pretty much finished. There was always some maintenance to do on it, some painting or electrical work or something. Um, our team did some of that. We did some construction on the church itself. Um, 
we had a large um, medical ministry there. Even though the clinic was there, um, we had doctors and nurses that from Wells Church, from the team, that went and um, would see patients and um, hand out medicines. We carried medicines. And also we carried, each of us would carry two duffel bags full of clothes to give away while we were there. But the main thing I did was take my cameras and take little the Epson little four by six printers and take pictures, set up a little studio basically in the church and take photos of the children in the village. Posed kind of like portraits. Po yeah, kind of like portraits because we were right next to the school, but I don't think um, if the school did do that, a lot of them probably couldn't afford it. Um, that wasn't really my, you know, I didn't care about that. I just, you know, did it. Somebody said, you know, this is, they would love doing it. And the fact that, you know, we were, we usually went the end of October, which is around the Day of the Dead celebration. And there were children that would come dressed up in their costumes. One little girl had just gotten a new bicycle. And she wanted her picture with her bicycle. It was like, sure, you know, whatever you want. So, you know, I had like a little mini studio photo lab set up. I would, at one year, I had like three printers going. I would take a few pictures and put the card in the printer and print them and put them in a folder and give them to them. And, you know, some of them was, and even I did the adults as well. Most of the men in the village were out working in the fields. So it was mostly the, the females, the moms, that would want their photo taken. And it was kind of interesting because normally I would just take like waist up like a nice little portrait, but the moms would want a full length photo of themselves um, as well, and I did both. But I would, you know, take print, I would say print anywhere from three, 400 pictures in a week of the kids and the people in the village. And you know, people still thank me for doing that. And um, one of the other things I do here at Wells, I kind of transition to that. Across the street is Galloway Elementary, and it's our we were one of the adopters of that school. And pretty much ever since I've started coming here, every Christmas I go over and take portraits of the children. Um, I know it's gotten a little better, but years ago. Very few of the children could afford school photos, portraits. So that was, you know, Wells' gift, my gift to those children. Um, I look at it like this. God gave me the gift of photography. I'm just sharing that gift. I mean, that's as simple as I can put it. And um, like I said, since we don't go to Mexico anymore because of the danger I spent two years without going on a mission trip and started having <clears throat> withdrawals. And through some other ministry, um, got to introduce some people that go to Honduras. They're there right now. I wish I was there with them. <laughs> um, we st I started going to Honduras, and I basically do the same thing in Honduras. I don't do it as formally as I did in Mexico, but I would take pictures and give to the kids and take pictures of the team working, building houses. We In Honduras, we do a little more. It's through Salt and Light Ministry, which started in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and we do construction, build houses, do vacation Bible school, medical if we got medical people on the team. We do evangelism. Um, I did that for three years and um, love it. And this will be my second year of not going on a mission trip again, so I'm starting to have withdrawals again. Like I said, I couldn't go this year because the United Methodist Annual Conference was this past week, and I'm the photographer for it. <laughs> they moved it. They moved the annual conference up a week because of Memorial Day. Yeah. And um, so that kind of messed me up going on that. What was the impact of going to Mexico, doing the initial mission trips in terms of like your faith life and your, your activity here at Wells? How did that, when you came back, how did that change?
change you or oh you yeah like i mean kind of effects, effects well you. you know i mean i had been out of state but never been out of the country and going to a third world country and seeing how they live you know it just changed you i mean you take things you don't take things as for granted any as much um you realize that you're blessed many times over for what you have and what God has provided for you. Um, when you see kids walking, running down the street with a bicycle rim, not even a tire, just a aluminum metal rim with sticks rolling it, smiling, having fun, you know, you just, you, you know that they're enjoying life as much as you are with all your toys and, and that you've got back home. Um, you know, getting up at the crack of dawn, going 20 minutes or so away to another nearby village and handing out clothes to the migrant workers and soup and coffee in the wee hours of the morning before they go out and spend all day in the fields. Um, picking tomatoes um, and you look up at the sky and see the stars that you think you could reach out and touch because you're so close you're up in the mountains um, you know just sharing God's love um, and through a couple other ministries I'm involved in and some at Wells are still involved in, but some have been involved in through the years and just kind of got burned out. One that is very dear to me and um, basically changed my life, um, just continued my my path of um, growing in Christ is um, called Crescio. And it's basically a three-day um, spiritual retreat that trains, equips the laity to come back into the church to to do, you know, be a leader. Um, but what it really does is three days of God's love, learning, f discovering what heaven is probably hopefully going to be like. Um, and I did that in 2007. And I've since been a leader um, I serve once a year on staff. Um, and through that Curcio ministry has led me to um, prison ministry called Kairos. And um, I'm on the advisory council of the Central Mississippi Kairos, Central Mississippi, or Mississippi, Cent Central Mississippi Kairos is, I guess, what it's called. Um, we just completed, we do two three-day retreats, kind of like Curcio, um, a year. We just finished one in March. We've got another one coming up in October. Um, I've done probably five of those and um, really enjoy it. You know, just sharing God's love is what it's all about. Let's talk about Wells worship service here and, and, and what elements of it that, that are oh, especially it's a good question you yeah and, you know. <clears throat> well you know I said early on that I was kind of worried about all the you know growing up in a very fundamental church and then coming to Methodist church it's very you know realist which blah, ritualistic <laughs> um that's not the so at Wales um you know we're and it's funny, but I love the rituals now. Um, I'm being a photographer, I don't do them anymore, but I used to do weddings as a photographer. And, you know, going to a Catholic church or an Episcopal church, you know, I love, you know, saying the doxology and saying and the other ritual parts of the service. Um, I enjoy that. But I like the laid back approach to Wales. It's like I tell people. One Sunday we may be United Methodist, and next Sunday we may be Pentecostal, we may be Baptist. It just it's just whatever the Holy Spirit and God you know leads us you know and Keith and the choir and the lay minister to do. Um, 
And that's what I like about it. I mean, it truly is, like the sign says out front, loving, caring, and sharing. And, um, you know, we're an all-inclusive church, and um, I just feel like that's, you know, that's what God wants us to do. Um, I do because of my um, involvement in Crescio, have gravitated more toward loving, liking contemporary music more. Um, you know, luckily our current choir director does, you know, some more of that. Um, he actually sings some, quote, Curcio songs from time to time we do. Um, they're not really Curcio songs, but we, we sing them a lot in Curcio. Um, I, you know, I like the, um, I attend the, the 11 o'clock service, um, because I'm still usually just getting up at 8.30. <laughs> um, I used to attend, you know, the, eight, the evening, Sunday evening service and the Wednesday evening service, but I don't do that as much anymore um, for well, several reasons. One, since my wife died 13 years ago, I had to raise, she was 11 at the time, my daughter, and... Um, I'm glad I mentioned that because I mentioned it at the beginning. If it wasn't for Wales, she probably wouldn't be here. She was 11 when Virginia died. And this church became the church. As in, after two months of them bringing me meals, casseroles and stuff to eat, us, I finally said, I love this, guys, but I need to learn how to cook on my own. You know, I mean, Wells was being the church. Um, you know, a single parent losing a wife with an 11-year-old to raise. Another church member stepped up, not even, I didn't even ask. She was at a school at the time. She still is, but not a different one. She said, I can take, Catherine can ride the bus from her school to my school in the afternoons. I can take care of her until you get through for the day. Um, just stuff like that, that they, you know, stepped up to the plate and did and helped. Um, and because of that and because of, you know, Catherine was raised in this church and baptized in this church, um, you know, it's helped shape her faith walk. Um, she's recently got married a little, almost a year ago and, um, but before that, she was in summer. She would be youth minister interns at churches and stuff. She's now a um, school teacher, elementary teacher. Her, she's going fits and start her third year of teaching. And, um, but like I said, because of the death of my wife, um, you know, Wells was being in the church. Um, the um lost my train of thought. <laughs> what was the question you asked? Well, me? you know, I was thinking about like kind of the you talked a little bit. I maybe talk just a little bit more about the music because it does seem uh, like a very distinctive. Because it is like people say, well, we do traditional, and then we might hear like Keith wants to hear <laughs> sitting by the dock of a bay, or you know, right. like you guys really have this wide range of. of spirituals well it's like i said the music at wells the first sunday i do remember the choir saying them dry bones and um you know i came from a church that you know was an acapella church didn't have any instrument instrumental music um and you know so the music i i love i'm not a great singer by no means but i love music and um i love the traditional hymns um, it's like I said, here in the past few years, I tend to gravitate more toward the contemporary type hymns just because I listen to it on the radio and, and you know, through Curcio and other ministries. Um, but the, the music here, we, we've got some talented musicians that are members here at Wales, professional talented musicians, my, might I add. They're professional. They, that's what they make their living at. So we're blessed with music here at Wells. 
Um, we're blessed with everything at Wells, for that matter. I mean, our ministers, our staff, um, you know, are just are wonderful. I mean, we've had our ups and downs. I mean, every church. But it's like we said last Sunday when we celebrated our 90th anniversary. I mean, and it was in the Clare and Ledger. It's the church that stayed. Um, I was a member of the board. I don't know if I was a trustee, but when we actually took a tour of the old former Capitol Street, United Methodist Church, over on Capitol Street, talking about maybe moving there, doing it's like, nope, we're staying here. We're ministering to the neighborhood. Since then, you know, I mean, through the years, we built habitat houses in this neighborhood. We rehab, rehabbed houses in this neighborhood. We ministered to the church, to the school across the street. Um, you know, the neighborhood appreciates that. And we do have some, you know, neighborhood people that are members here. Not a lot. I mean, the majority of the congregation, you know, lives, you know, way in, not in the neighborhood. I mean, some drive from Brandon, you know, um, South Jackson, Madison, you know, to come here. When people, when you tell people who are Wells members, oh, I, I go to Wells Church, what's, what's the reaction kind of in the general community about what they know, what do, what do they say about Wells or what do they know about it or what do they want to know? Most people know about Wells. The one thing they, most people do know is that Keith Tunkel has been here for 40-something years, which is highly unusual in the Methodist Church. And, of course, with Keith's presence on TV and just being in this community for so long, most people know him. Um, you know, some don't. Um, but they, you know, if they don't know anything, about Wells, you know, like I said before, I just tell them, oh, we're, you know, loving, caring, sharing, and some, you know, we, we may be Methodist in our service, another week we may be Pentecostal, you know. You'll see people, you know, clapping and, you know, with the songs and raising their hands, and, um, but it's, um, you know, and then, you know, quite frankly, we've lost the membership because we're a loving, caring, sharing, all-inclusive church. Um, you know, that's their prerogative. Um, you know, it's not what I believe, but that's that's their prerogative. Um, if they, you know, and for a number of years, since I've been here 30 years, the... Um, Attendance has gone up and down. The number of children and youth have gone up and down. And one of the big problems we have at being an inner city church is because once the children get to youth age, to teenagers, they want to go to church with the friends that they are in school with. And you can't blame them for that. Right. But... You know, we fought that through the years, but currently, you know, we have a, you know, real good active youth program. We got good directors there as we speak in um, um, Houston, Texas, doing ministry work. Um, there, they've gone to Lake Junaluska um, Methodist Retreat Center camp in North Carolina through the years. Um, my daughter was fortunate to do that with the church and later one summer was on staff there. Um, through early on when I became, when it was here, the youth didn't do that. They didn't do anything in the summer. Um, so we've stepped up, you know, that presence. But it's a continuing battle, you know, uphill battle as far as the youth. Um, children as well. Um, you know, we are always, you know, well, Keith said that last Sunday in his vision for the church in the future and all, you know, to get more children here, you know, families and stuff. And, you know, we we do a good job. We could always probably do better at uh, ministering to children and youth. But I compared to what I've seen through the years of being a member here, we're we're doing a good job now. 
Tell me about kind of your you were talking about being being a trustee and, and, and being in these various kind of like leadership councils. Was that something that you that you were kind of pursued for, or that you, did people ask you to do that? And what? Tell me a little about some of your experiences doing that. Well, when Virginia and I, my late wife, were co-chairs of council and ministry, I think we just kind of because I involved through our involvement, we just kind of gravitated to that role. And Wells always has a policy of if you want to serve on a, the council ministries or administrative board or serve on a committee, you're basically self-appointed. I mean, there may be people that say, why don't you, you know, ask Greg or do that? But it's basically, you know, whoever serve, wants to serve, we, you know, let them serve. Um, I mean, it's a responsibility. I'm, um, like I said, I'm still on the um, the administrative board. Um, I don't come as much as I would like to, with you know other obligations and stuff. Um, but it's um, you know after being here thirty years, there's pros and guns. You know, it's nice to let some new blood come in and take some leadership roles. Um, and also, you know, at the same time, some of us that's been around for a long time, you know, having our opinion on the decision making, um, boards is good as well, I guess you could say. Um, I'm trying to think of any other, um, The um, I can't. I mean, that's basically my Wells. I mean, I've got. Um, you know, I did the newsletter for a long time. I did, you know, Wells Fast. I did. I go to Galloway and take those pictures at Christmas. I with at the part of our doctor school. I said I go to Galloway Elementary across the street and take. Um, basically portraits before Christmas and I get a four by six printed for each child and put in a little Christmas folder and they can take home. Um, I don't do that by myself, by no means. I get assistance from, I call them my elves from Wells, helping me um, either do the actual photography or to help the children line up um, make sure their clothes are straight, their noses are wiped, um, all that stuff that goes, you know, into taking a, a good, nice photo of a child, a student. Um, and, um, you know, it's my, you know, gift, you know, to Galloway. I used to, um, you know, get help from the church financially on that, but now I just do it because God's blessed me um, you know through the years we I've helped with cookouts at the end of the school year uh, that we used to have for the kids over there um, we'd have programs and send in programs we give out um, awards and stuff and um, we still do once at, at the end of the year we have a Galloway Awards night where we give out awards to the kids that are most improved and stuff like that Correct. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we've um, I've seen the neighborhood change in the thirty years of being here, um, mainly because of Wells buying up the properties um, on the corner across the street was a you know drug house of prostitution, and we bought it and that and another house next to it, and now it's we use it for parking and and we've got gardens planted. We've got, um, and I think that's one of the things the neighborhood loves about us staying here is we have beautified the area by having um, church members who talent and gifts and graces are gardening and and um, planting trees and plants and shrubs and stuff and making it look beautiful. 
we have a um, the area's first urban garden across the street from the church dedicated to um, Jesse Gates, a um, son of a two members at Wales that um, died tragically. Um, and we, like I said, we built um, habitat houses in the neighborhood. Then we started after habitat got um, a little too expensive for us. We started buying rundown houses and rehabbing them. Um, our church um, guard lives in one of them. Um, we meet my our Sunday school class, Keith's, um, called the Serendipity um, Houses across the street. We purchased it and rehabbed it. And we use it for Sunday school and also for um, Sunday night services. Um, you know, so we we bettered the neighborhood yeah. through the years. What do you think about, you know, with, because of Keith's age and, you know, his longevity, you know, <clears throat> obviously not going to be here forever for you. What do you, how do you see the future of Wells stretching out for you? Just celebrate your anniversary. What do you see the next, how, how do you see the future going for Wells, especially with, you know, eventually having, you know, a, another pastor here? I've often thought about that and prayed about it. Um, personally, um, I would hope and pray and I'd say right now 90% chance that I would stay here. Um, I know a lot of people that come because of Keith. I mean, the fact that we have an associate minister now who is wonderful. John is great. I love his preaching. But the fact is when he preaches, the attendants say it because 11 o'clock service is what I come to. If he's preaching 11 o'clock, the attendants and as good as when Keith is preaching. And I hate that because they both have their gift and graces. They both have their styles. And I like both of them. Um, I would hope, and like I said, I'm pretty sure hopefully I stay here, even though I've got friends and um, through my involvement with the United Methodist Church now that, you know, minister, you know, at other churches around here and stuff and know about their ministry. Um, I guess I'll have to cross that bridge when it gets here. But um, my hope and prayer is that Wells Church will continue. The ministries will continue. Um, after Keith is, you know, left. Um, I mean, that's my hope and prayer that 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 Wells will continue. But it seems like there is kind of a, a core strength to the church that extends out beyond Keith and that there is a, a real strong community here that would continue on, maybe not in the same way. It would obviously change. But. Oh, yes, there is. And, and Keith would be the first to tell you. A lot of people say, oh, that's Keith's church. It's not Keith's church, and he'll be the first to tell you that. It's Wells Church, and, I mean, it's like he says, and we do every Sunday. The services start out by a layperson up in that pulpit welcoming people. Um, I mean, it's a lay, you know, run church. Um, and, you know, yeah, the you're right. It reaches out beyond him and stuff and, you know, in the community with Wells Fest, with the missions, with the neighborhood ministry on Tuesday mornings that we have here. Um, they're... There's a need for an inner city church. You know, everybody doesn't need to be in the suburbs. Um, I mean, that is what Wells has always been about that I know of, and that's what we're about now. And I feel sure that we'll be back in the future is ministry to God's people, either in the neighborhood or 
you know, outside the neighborhood, like through events like Wells Fest. Um, you know, I've, like I said, it's in a way it can be kind of scary to think of the future. <laughs> it's like they asked me to be Rotary president last year, and I said, nah, ask me again this year, be on path to be president. And um, finally I said, yeah, you've asked me two years in a row, that's an honor, I need to say yeah. But at the same time, I don't like to think about what's gonna be four years ahead of now. <laughs> you know. But I guess I'll cross that bridge when I get to it, you know. Um, but, well, it's just like this past Sunday, I had worked 45 hours in basically three days being the official photographer at the United Methodist Conference annual meeting downtown at the convention center. And um, if there was any day or reason or excuse to sleep in Sunday and not come, it would have been this past Sunday. And obviously a bunch of other people decided to because our attendance was way down. But whenever I made the decision to crawl out of bed, whether I'm tired or not quite sick enough to really stay home, after I come here, I leave here thanking God for dragging me out of bed to come here because it just lifts you up. And, you know, that's that's what it's all about. Um, worshiping God, loving God, being around people that love God and worship God. Um, I mean, this... My... My Wells family is very dear to me, as you can probably tell through my talk today, but I mean, it's just because of Wells, I'm where I am today. I'm blessed with life, with gifts, with talents, with um, friendships that last forever. Um, it's just, um, people ask me, you know, how you doing, Greg? I mean, my motto is now I'm blessed. And, you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't say that. 10 years ago, I probably couldn't say that. Um, but going through a tragic event, like your wife dying and having an 11-year-old to raise, and having this church be the church. You know, I don't know what else I could say about yeah, Wells. You, you about grace for sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, that just, you know, and I've seen it not just personally, but I've seen it with other people countless times, the church being the church. And that's one of the things we, one of the talks that, for CO and Kairos is the church. And it's like, you know, we say, who's the church? We are the church. It's not the building. It's the people. And the people that come to worship at this, I can't remember, I can't believe I forgot the address, 2019 Bailey Avenue, or the church. They know what it means to be the church and to help others. Um, and that's what it's all about. It's not about seeing how much money you can raise to, you know, build a fancy new gym or to do whatever. Um, it's, you know, if the money, if the need is there, to raise the money like it is now. We're trying to renovate our um, kitchen and fellowship hall because it hadn't been done since 
right before I joined 30 years ago. Um, the need is there. It will happen. Um, this church was paid off after they renovated 30 years ago. That building fund was pretty much paid off after it was when they dedicated it. Um, you know, like I said, we've had our ups and downs, but we're still we're still here, ninety years later. <laughs> well, great. Um, I don't have any more questions for you. Is there anything that we didn't touch on? I can't think. I mean, I'd, you'd like to add I mean, I like to talk. Um, no, I mean, I think that's basically it. The what I've been involved in, you know, what I've seen, you know, my hope. <laughs> um, like I said, I've seen ups and downs, you know. We, you know, lost some members one time because of Sunday school literature for the children, you know. Keith talked about that this past Sunday at the celebration. Um, you know, I mean, that's part of growing. There's, you know, there's all kinds of denominations. There are all kinds of Methodist churches out there. Um, but there are a lot of people that worship here that pass at least one Methodist church, probably, you know, other churches too, before they come here just because it meets their needs. And through the years, we've had people come and go because their need had been met. They decided to go on to another path in their life. But, um, you know, then there are people like me and other saints. Well, other I'm not calling myself a saint. But other members that decided that, you know, their needs are still being met here and they're still here. Um, I would probably only say there's a handful of us had been here 30 or longer, you know. Um, Wells can tend to be a, you know, transition church. And it's typical of any church. You start out pretty much sitting in the balcony and you kind of gravitate down, you know. And I now I like sitting toward the front, either usually the second or third rows, preferably, just because you get more out of it. Um, but the other th oh the other thing about Wells that um, I don't know if it played a part of me loving it or not, but a lot of churches you go to they make you fill out a visitor's card and they'll either visit you or you know send you stuff. We don't do that here. Um, we basically let you gravitate into the churches on your own free will. Um, if you want to sit in the balcony every Sunday and as soon as the service is over, leave and not take a part in anything, that's fine. But if you want to gradually move from the balcony to, you know, up front and get involved, that's your discretion. Um, we don't hound you on it. Um, you know, we, we let you, you know, we just let you have your own free will as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like that because they've come from other churches, denominations that don't do that. And, um, you know, they feel like they've been, you know, pressured or, you know. And uh, that's one thing that I think that's different about Wales is, you know, you can... And on that same note, some people call us cliquish, that we have cliques. Every group has cliques. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to be a member of that clique, we're, we're going to let you join us. I mean, people accuse Corsillo of that. That's why um, my late wife was kind of turned off by it when we first came to Wales. I didn't know anything about it. And um, she felt like it was kind of cliquish, and she never really wanted to be a part. But, um, you know, we're just, if you know, if you want to be a part of something and you want to do something, just speak it, you know. 
say, can I help or can I get involved? Or That's like I said, when we first started coming, we got involved in those home study groups almost immediately, and that, you know, led us into knowing more people and getting involved. And um, we were probably just both thirsty for a Christian, well, I know I was, for a Christian fellowship. You know, I lived that wildlife <laughs> for a number of years and I was it was maturity is what it was yeah. well thank you so much for your time today I really appreciate it you're welcome I hope I got what you needed I well I said I you know y'all been doing this for what about a year now or yeah they've been yeah kind of I guess on and off yeah but I was like hey I've been here 30 years I got something to say yeah absolutely you know um been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs>